Amal, thank you so much for coming on to the Corporate Treasury 101 podcast. Um, we'd love your insights on what's going on nowadays with the macro economy, interest rates, etc. I think all treasuries are quite interested. I think there might be a little bit of fatigue around hearing it again and again, but I'm sure you have some very interesting insights. So start us from perhaps the people that aren't keeping so close to the news. Um, what is the current macroeconomic landscape, especially concerning the interest rates and how the interest rates are and are going nowadays? Uh, well, first, thanks for having me on the, the podcast, Hussam and uh, Guillaume. Uh, very excited to chat with you both and uh, share some of these insights uh, w with the audience. I like to call us in the uh, the, uh, the economy, certainly in the U.S., uh, but but uh, really overall, uh, in a little bit of a Goldilocks phase. Uh, you know, not too hot, not too cold, just right. Uh, that, that's probably the the best way to to think about it. Whether that holds true a few weeks from now or a few months from now, that's a different topic of of conversation. But right now, it feels as though global central bankers have navigated this period of really high inflation, geopolitical uh, challenges, wars going on, and other you know, obstacles uh, relatively well, uh, better than I think most would have predicted. Economies continue to grow, but not too fast, <laughs> you know, not too much, uh, not too much growth to lead to more inflation. Uh, we're not seeing that much of a slowdown. And while unemployment, certainly, let me focus on the U.S. for a minute, is growing. It hasn't grown by so much that we have you know, big global challenges like a global recession that that uh, we're thinking about today as we record this. Again, who knows uh, what what could happen in, in the coming weeks and months. So that's an interesting perspective because. It I think most treasurers would disagree with you there about this Goldilocks zone because I think for the role of the corporate treasurer is interest rates are high, my debt's expensive. That's that's <laughs> that's really it. Perhaps the yield aspect of your savings have gone up and that's nice and everything like that, but that's not the priority of a treasurer, right? Your yield is not the priority. It's it's uh, liquidity and then and then being able to raise debt and be not too much of a cost burden in how you support the business. How do you see the current interest rates and the environment impacting corporate treasurers? Oh, I mean that that uh, that's a different question. <laughs> the economy <laughs> and how uh, corporate treasurers feel is, is different. It's like uh, you know anyone who's uh, you know going to buy a house, uh, they're looking yeah. at mortgage rates and saying, "Oh my goodness, this is so high." The flip side of that is, "Hey, thank goodness we don't have unemployment, and and there, you actually have income in order to be able to even potentially afford maybe a smaller house that, than you wanted." But for corporate treasurers, uh, the the big challenge is. Uh, rates have, you know, cost of financing has gone up by two, three X, maybe four X, depending on you know, the type of company you are. High yield uh, is you know, a little bit of a different story than, than investment grade globally. And so this is not to make light of this, but uh, but there's a little bit of a grieving cycle uh, here for, for corporate treasurers and, and CFOs, uh, which is, uh, we, all, we all start with denial. Uh, that's, oh, you know, uh, <laughs> Rates won't stay at 5% forever. Uh, and you can even see that in the forward curve. The market's expecting rates to come down precipitously. And, and that may happen. Who knows? But there's this bit of denial until eventually we all get to acceptance. We get there at different speeds. Uh, different businesses have different abilities to withstand this rate shock. And I wouldn't even call it a shock. I mean, we have higher rates than, than what we've had uh, the last you know decade plus. And so when we look at that scenario, uh, you know, companies are just going to be in, in different places on, on being able to get to acceptance. Some have gotten there dealing with refinancing, dealing with you know acquisition finance, growing through this. Others have not quite gotten there yet. And, and they're really asking them, themselves the question of, you know, will it get better in the future uh, or should I take what's available to me now? And very difficult uh, very, very difficult to answer that question in, in a vacuum, but uh, but I think that's my answer to, to your question, Hussam. It's that uh, we're, we're not everyone is at acceptance in the grieving cycle yeah. yet. So, do, does everyone need to? Know? So, how do you see that playing out? What's your general advice on the microeconomic trend to corporate treasures? Is the best line of approach to stick, you know, like do what you can with the current environment? Don't expect it to come back down. Is it here to last? Yeah, our, our rates here forever and here to stay, the market definitely does not believe that, right? Uh, when you look at the market, the market is absolutely expecting recession in the future. To be clear, the market has been calling a recession for a very long time. Uh, that's not to belittle that call. It's just, uh, I think this is going to be the most widely called recession in the history of the world. I mean, everyone and their 
grandmother will be able to say that, uh, you know, I saw this coming. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, your question is, what can companies do and what can corporate treasurers do today? I, I think, you know, unfortunately, the best time to be prepared for higher rates was yesterday, um, but the next best time uh, is today. And, you know, from a capital structure standpoint, uh, having a laddered capital structure is uh, ideal rather than having everything maturing all at once. Having a variety of funding sources is helpful. Uh, so not just relying on one market. So if you're a bank or just relying on the bank market might be challenging because banks can be interested or not in, in lending to, uh, to your business or to your industry. Diversifying funding sources, diversifying your capital stack, all of that is, is really helpful. And even in the current environment, thinking deeply about you know, what your future capital structure looks like, uh, how you should be thinking about sources of debt, fixed floating, how you should be thinking about hedging. You know, that, uh, as a firm, Chatham spends an inordinate amount of time uh, working with our clients on financial risk management and interest rates is a big piece of that. Uh, so we have lots of depth that we can get into here. Uh, we don't want to Take, go down too many rabbit trails, but uh, but but I think those are some of the pieces of advice that I would have. Is you know, yesterday was the best time, but the next best time is today. It shouldn't matter whether rates are higher or lower. Really developing a capital structure and a robust hedging program that withstands all of these different scenarios is the job of the corporate treasurer uh, to to really take that to the CFO and the board and make sure everyone's on aligned to support that program. I like that a lot, and it's funny to see that the circumstances change the framework on how to handle risk management doesn't like diversification, making sure to mitigate the risk, having different sources of funding is evergreen concept that you should be applying anyways, whether it's high or low interest rate, because a, anything gets changed over time. So that's, that's what happens. And B, when it changes, you want to be prepared. And that's what risk mitigation is all about here. To maybe make the parallel between, okay, people who want to mortgage and afford a house and maybe the interest rates uh, cannot allow such a big house nowadays, but maybe tomorrow it will. What's the recommendation for people who, or for companies who are sub-investment grade or on the contrary investment grade? Are there different considerations here given the macroeconomic outlook? Should they be watching out for the same things or a bit different? Um, if the cost of debt is much higher, does it mean sub-investment grades are uh, how to put that incorporated in a bad position <laughs> or what should they do? What are the differences here? Uh, yeah, Guillaume, I'd, I'd say there are different scenarios to, to consider for high yield versus investment grade. So starting with investment grade, capital sources are plentiful uh, for them. Bond markets are open and yes, the cost of financing is higher, but uh, we've seen it, you know, frankly, for the last three years that the ability to get financing for investment grade companies is not necessarily the, the challenge. The challenge is, you know, can you get to acceptance on the, on the higher rates? Um, and are there, you know, some different structures that you want to consider, uh, even in the investment grade space? But investment grade, uh, I think, has a bit of an easier time, to, to your point, than the high yield issuers uh, do. We've seen many times over the last several years where the high yield market is closed, you know, hung term loan Bs uh, on bank balance sheets, uh, has closed things down a n number of times. You know, banks have taken large losses on on buyout loans and, and other you know loans of, of that type. Uh, they've marked down uh, the value of those, which just makes it harder. The good news, though, uh, is that there's a whole new source of capital that's come in uh, that has been in the market for a long time, but but has really come in in force, uh, which is on the private capital and private debt side. Uh, you see some of the largest alternative asset managers in the world raising these private capital and private debt funds. Uh, so it's those um, sources of capital are really taking uh, what used to be, I would call it traditional bank lending and putting it more in on the balance sheet of these funds. So taking it off of the banks onto these funds. And there's a tremendous amount of capital that's been raised uh, for, for these vehicles, uh, which means they're chasing deals which means they're looking for good companies to, to lend to. And so while rates are higher, it's, and there have been periods, more often periods of you know, challenging funding environments for high yield companies, uh, the good news is more sources and a lot more capital going to those new sources of, uh, of debt, uh, which means that uh, 
there is funding available for companies that want to. And if you're a high yield uh, borrower, that's you know one of the uh, conversations that that certainly you know we've had advising on capital structure. Uh, you know, do you want to take your term loan B and turn it into and replace it with uh, you know private debt capital uh, instead? So go from bank borrowing to you know a different institution. So there there are a lot of these types of um, opportunities that are available. Uh, the, again, the hard thing is you have to come to acceptance that the cost of financing is, is higher. Not just our rates higher, but the spreads are higher. And one strategy is is hope. Uh, but uh, I think somebody there's some famous line that says hope is not a strategy. Uh, but uh, you know, that certainly is, is something to consider. Just wait and see if things get a little bit better. But will things get back to where we were uh, immediately at the time that we were during COVID, where we saw 0% interest rates or negative interest rates in Europe uh, and other places around the globe, phenomenally tight spreads, you know, tons of investor demand for, uh, for all these types of assets. It, it feels like a little bit of a different world today than what we were in just a few years ago. And so to take the other side of the, of the spectrum for the people who, for the company who look into investing in this high lead environment, how does it work? What are the circumstances for them that needs to be taken into account when it comes to investing because they have an excess of cash? Yeah, we're not, uh, we're not cash experts, but I will say, isn't it nice to get a return on cash uh, for, for the first time? <laughs> um, for sure it is. Just, uh, you're not just talking about earnings credits against, uh, you know, against um, big balances with zero percent or negative interest rates that, that you're earning on it. You're actually able to to generate some return. Um, and so, you know, some of the conversations that uh, that we've heard from from our clients, which tend to be large multinationals, corporate treasurers of of those types of firms, has been a move away from some of the incremental search for yield that was happening in the low rate environment and back to basics is maybe the, the best way to put it on uh, on investment and cash management um, today where we say, hey, let's we don't have to get too creative about the incremental search for yield because there is yield and, uh, and return available uh, for our balances. This is generally true for investment grade companies. Well, sorry, yields available for everybody, but investment grade companies are the ones that have cash to invest. Um, as opposed to to, to high yield uh, borrowers, but it's a little bit again, like I said, back to basics of you know let's just make sure that we're looking at uh, the right tenors, the right asset classes. We're not tying up our cash for too long. We have the right level of liquidity uh, that that we want, and there is again capital that you can invest uh, with lots of places where you can generate a, a forget positive, but but a decent return. So. This goes back to what we were talking about earlier, you know, this uh, this idea that, um, you know, these strategies that companies come up with, whether on the financing side or the investing side, are uh, are essentially evergreen, um, and, and they should be somewhat agnostic to the market environment with, of course, tweaks for the market environment. It's a little bit different being, a, you know, borrowing at 8 9% money versus borrowing at 3 4% money. Uh, but uh, but having a strategy that uh, that endures and survives through all of that uh, is what I would say the leading you know treasury professionals, capital markets uh, professionals are, are have put in place. Makes a lot of sense. Amo, we would love to deep dive into debt structuring and funding and how all this macroeconomic landscape and change in interest rate and maybe whether it's here to stay or not. How does that impact treasury and how they should be thinking their debt structuring. So maybe can you walk us through that to begin with? Like, can you dive into how the interest rate changes are affecting debt structuring for corporates and maybe at the same time and making the link with the banks, how does that impact corporates, but also banks in the debt structuring? Yeah, absolutely. I think, so what's interesting is if you look at it from a macroeconomic standpoint, uh, most of the studies would say this global rise in interest rates has not actually hit corporate interest expense all that much. It hasn't been that dramatic of a move. And the reason for that is that most companies have moved towards, uh, certainly if you're investment grade, tend to be more you know, heavily fixed rate borrowers with uh, issuances that happened you know, pre-pandemic or during the pandemic, really in a lower rate environment. And so, yes, rates are higher, but if, you, if your next bond doesn't mature for seven years, you're watching it and saying, well, you know, let's see what happens. There's all, probably a whole nother cycle to go before, you know, we need to do something. For those that are more floating rate borrowers, again, very different. And, and they're impacted 
certainly on the cost of their term loans or any floating rate debts uh, that they have outstanding, that cost uh, has certainly grown significantly, particularly if the company has not hedged their interest expense. Uh, now, most prudent floating rate borrowers uh, have hedged in, in some way or had hedged uh, in some way. Maybe they hadn't hedged 100% of their debt. Maybe they hadn't locked it up with interest rate swaps, and maybe they'd purchased some interest rate caps to essentially uh, consider them a form of insurance. You have some risk that you're willing to take, and then above that, the, the cap will protect you. Uh, so there's been some marginal increase. Uh, but again, at the, at the macro level, uh, the studies would say really hasn't impacted corporates that much. At the micro level, if you're that company that has floating rate debt and didn't do much hedging, um, you're feeling this a, a lot uh, right now, which is why we say you know having that strategy before uh, you need it, you want to have that insurance in place before you get into an accident or before the fire starts in your house. Uh, because when... When the fire starts, it's already too late. For them. You don't want to be calling around for insurance. Then. So a big part of this is, you know, what kind of company are you? Are you one that can withstand this uh, uh, this scenario? And you might even have another cycle or, or two. We have a client that has you know, predominantly issues 30-year debt. Um, you know, they have long-lived assets, investment grade. Uh, they're fine is probably the, the, the best way to put it. Uh, next set of debt doesn't mature for like 15, 20 years. CFO probably, you know, is feeling really good about the, you know, pre-issuance edges, forward starting swaps that that he executed when he was treasurer three years ago uh, dur during COVID. Um, so he's already locked out, uh, you know, uh, debt that's coming due in, in several years at very low rates. How he feels is very different than the, you know, high yield borrower that's having a tough time refinancing because the business is uh, a little bit challenged and interest rates are higher, uh, and, and that's a really uh, challenging. Uh, situation to, to navigate uh, right now because some level you'll have to make a choice. At some point, you have to make a choice of saying, do I go back to my existing lenders and you know try to get an extension? Do I do something more significant? You know, how much am I really impacted from an interest coverage standpoint uh, when rates are two, three x higher than, than what they were when I financed this back in you know 2019, 2020? Yeah. 15 to 20 years indeed sounds like a pretty safe horizon. You're, you're pretty, pretty well <laughs> off uh, for the coming years. But so what about the investment grade companies that have debt maturing right now or one year ago or in one year, which have this safety and comfort of being investment grade, maybe even with a bit of excess cash, but need to walk through debt because that's how a lot of companies work. They're like, their debt is maturing now in a period of high yield interest rate, and they already extended their RCF to take an example. What's the impact on them and how should they approach it as a treasurer? So an interesting thing, they tend, investment grade companies tend not to worry about capital availability. Um, so that's good news. They get to optimize for cost of capital even more, and they're really fine tuning on, on cost of capital. So one trend that we've really seen that's been interesting, and you know, is as as volatility in uh, in rates has has increased, uh, and that doesn't just mean rates going up. Uh, you know, we've seen the ten year Treasury in the U.S., for example, crest over five percent and then go back down to four fifty and then back up to four seventy five. And this is literally, you know, while people were probably having the discussions internally on whether we finance now or later, or, you know, what have you. It's literally in the span of days uh, that, that we've seen these types of movements. Investment grade companies are actually paying more attention to um, tools that are available to them, like pre-issuance hedging, uh, which is essentially allowing you to decouple pricing of your bond from, uh, you know, and, and the spread on your bond from the underlying interest rate at which you might issue that. Uh, and so, typical for an investment grade company, if you're going to do a billion dollar issuance, is you do the issuance all in one day. You you know you have the go no go call in, in the morning. You decide. Uh, you know, to, to issue or not, and, and you price a billion right then and there, which means you're at the whim of a few different things. Uh, one, you have specific windows on which you can issue given your earnings period, blackout period. Two, within those windows, you can delay by a day or two, um, of course, but you're a little bit at the whim of whatever rates are on those dates, uh, right? So if the tenure treasury, if it happened to be a day when the tenure of treasury crested 5%, and the next day it went back down to 485. Um, that's 15 basis points that you uh, may have left on, uh, on the table. And the hard thing is it's not about trying to get the best rate in the market. It's about creating some level of predictability so that you can 
plan on a longer term basis for the business uh, and for the capital structure. Uh, so the tool that we've seen a lot of investment grade companies leveraging, uh, no pun intended, uh, is uh, these pre-issuance hedges where uh, they might dollar cost average uh, into, into hedging what that 10 year rate might be on their debt. And rather than waiting for what it is on one day, again, you know, personal finance example for any investments we do, generally dollar cost averaging leads to less volatility than picking one day. Uh, now, maybe you pick that day and it was the best day in the market. Maybe you pick it, it's the worst day in the market. But that's not what corporate treasurers are paid for, is, as you both highlighted at the start of this conversation. Uh, they're focused on uh, reducing volatility for their companies and ensuring liquidity. Uh, and that reduction in volatility comes from leveraging some of these tools that, you know, when rates were 0%, wasn't something that, uh, that people were paying as much attention to as now we're seeing these big swings due to, you know, changes that can happen either geopolitical events or Powell speaking at a conference or, you know, a presidential election. There are these big macroeconomic uh, events that are happening that are driving it. And you don't want to be the, the treasurer that's issuing uh, the day that uh, the day that one of those events occurs and you have no choice but to issue that day. Indeed. And so what about the banks, Amor? Like that's the corporate treasurer's perspective, the company's perspective. What about the banks? How do they, how should they approach this whole macroeconomic environment? And what have you seen happening in the consequences that they have to face and how they actually walk around those? Yeah, so, so super interesting. I mean, as of now, you know, banks are, they're, they're not having great earnings years. Um, and usually what that means is that they have to relook at their portfolio and figure out where they're investing and, and where they aren't investing. Uh, uh, but you know, banks are impacted by this higher cost of capital just as much as everyone else, uh, right? They, they, they now back, back to what we were talking about on the investment side. Now banks are paying interest on deposits. That that wasn't a thing as recently as just a few years ago. Uh, there was no interest really to to pay, um, and so you know, banks are finding themselves uh, still. You know, they have these uh, they have these deposits. They're not paying, call it you know, full. Uh, full freight uh, rates uh, on, but uh, but they're higher th than it was before. Their cost of capital has increased. They've had a hard time, uh, depending on the bank and the, the markets in, in which they operate. And so for banks, actually, I would say what's interesting for them is that they have some competition, in these alternative sources of capital uh, that, that we've uh, discussed. And so on one hand, they'd love to you know lend out capital at, at higher and higher rates, uh, but there are these uh, these competitors, for for lack of a better term, that that are out there. And an interesting trend we're seeing now is banks starting to actually partner with with some of these shops and saying, you know what, we'll we'll do some private lending either from our balance sheet or we'll introduce others uh, into this capital structure so that we as a bank are not taking on all the risk ourselves. There's some very significant innovation happening, I would say. And even in the next few months, we're going to see, and next few quarters, we're going to see meaningful changes to financing markets, even for investment grade companies. Uh, we're already starting to see that. Uh, investment grade companies starting to partner with banks, and alternative capital sources in different ways for project finance or infrastructure finance or specific investments uh, that, that they might be uh, making, looking at capital structures differently. And again, this is, you ask, well, you know, what are the banks doing? The banks are figuring out how to make money. That that's their job. <laughs> um, they're, they're they're figuring out how to do it while reducing their capital costs. Uh, and you know, part of that is working with uh, with companies for creative solutions, uh, whether you're investment grade or or sub investment grade. Uh, that that's been the case. Very interesting. Um, Amal, give us a Treasury one hundred and one uh, take on how the current interest rates are linked to the derivatives market uh, and then also how do interest rates impact the derivative market and what's the derivative market doing right now? Yeah, so I'd say we've seen, uh, so the derivatives market has been really interesting for the past few years, especially on the rate side. Uh, one, uh, rates have gone up a, a lot, uh, as we've talked about. Um, two, We've actually seen one of the biggest changes uh, that's ever happened in our lifetime uh, occur uh, with relatively little impact on both derivatives and, and financing markets, which is the move away from IBORs um, globally. Uh, you know, LIBOR being the, the poster child in the US, but 
uh, but you know, really all the eyebores going away uh, has been a really significant uh, change. And so derivative markets have had to withstand uh, one, I'd say increased scrutiny and volume as more companies, more users are used leveraging derivatives in order to ma mitigate their, their interest rate risk while changing the underlying index off of which everything is, is done uh, in the world. It's the old, uh, you know, changing the tire while you're driving the car uh, d down the road. That, that is uh, physically impossible, uh, but, but that is exactly what's been asked of, uh, of derivatives markets in the last several years. And so we, we weathered the IBOR transition. Higher rates has led to meaningful increase in usage of derivatives by end users, by corporates, uh, by, by corporate treasury teams. And it's unfortunately a little bit reactionary. It would have been good to have done some of that hedging before rates went up by 400 basis points. Uh, but, uh, but, but I think there's a lesson there. For everyone. So we've seen a, a big increase uh, there. In terms of derivatives themselves, I'd say the most commonly used uh, derivatives we've seen by corporate treasury are, uh, we've seen a lot more usage of interest rate swaps. Interest rate caps are still popular, but but generally, uh, you know, depending on what you're trying to do, may have gotten materially more expensive, uh, whereas swaps in an inverted yield curve uh, are allowing companies to actually lock in lower rates for longer periods of time. That's a very unusual situation. Most of the time, uh, we have an upward sloping yield curve, so that means rates are higher in the future uh, than they are for, or rates are higher for longer term debt than they are for shorter term debt. Where we are today is rates are lower for shorter term or for longer term than, than shorter term, which is very different. And the other uh, trend that we've seen, particularly for multinationals, uh, is cross-currency swaps. So going from borrowing in one currency to another um, and finding some type of funding arbitrage uh, that may not be readily available or as easily available in different funding markets. And so those, those tools have become increasingly popular uh, for a variety of reasons. Namely, there are ways to reduce interest expense. Uh, that's been the big headline, uh, you know, swap longer, we can actually go lower than what uh, SOFR is today and do a cross-currency swap. We can change our effective interest rate from, you know, if you're borrowing in the U.S. at, you know, 5 6% something to Japan, borrowing essentially at 2% uh, something. Uh, so, so those have been some of the trends that we've seen the last few months, uh, last few quarters, I'd say, in the derivatives market. Could you explain us a bit, uh, Amol, just to go back to Treasury 101 a bit, What's the cross-currency swap and why it is particularly re relevant in that scenario? Like why would companies tend to use that more in a high interest period? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, they can use it in any interest period, uh, but uh, cross-currency swap is taking a, a, a step back uh, from this. Is it's an interest rate swap where a company is exchanging payments in one currency for payments in another. So let's take a simple example. Let's say you're a U.S.-based uh, multinational. You're borrowing in U.S. dollars, and I'm going to make up these numbers. Please don't, uh, you know, if anyone's listening, don't, <laughs> don't, uh, don't go off and try to trade off of this. Uh, this is not uh, live or real time. But uh, conceptually, you're, let's say you're borrowing in the U.S. at seven percent, um, uh, and you say, well, you know, we set, happen to have a lot of positive earnings uh, in in Japan. Uh, what can we do uh, with that? Well, one tool that uh, they could do is say, hey, well, why don't we just go and borrow in Japan? Uh, instead of borrowing in the U.S., why don't we repay our U.S. borrowings and go borrow in, in Japan? That could be great, uh, but maybe uh, they've never done a, de a deal in Japan before. Maybe the quantum that the company wants to actually issue in Japan, given their earnings in Japan, is not large enough to warrant an, an issuance. You know, Maybe you have to do a much larger issuance than, than the amount that you can really uh, withstand. And so one tool that this company can use is a cross-currency swap. And in the cross-currency swap, essentially the company would go out and pay a Japanese yen interest rate, and I'm going to make up the number, let's say it's 2%, uh, and receive 6% from their cross-currency swap counterpart. Uh, so now the company has 6% bond in the U.S. Uh, hopefully that was the number I used earlier. Uh, <laughs> I think it was or 7 something like or 6 seven. or 7%. Okay. In this, right. well, in this let's, waters. Let's, let's go with six because I haven't <laughs> well, no. to acceptance yet either. Let's, let's go with the old rates. So you're borrowing at 6% um, in, in the U.S. Um, you enter into this cross-currency swap. You're receiving payments of 6% um, USD from your cross-currency swap counterparty. That cancels with your bond that you just issued or, or that you have outstanding. 
And now you're left with these 2% Japanese yen payments to your cross-currency swap counterpart. So essentially, it allows you to synthetically convert that US dollar offering into a yen offering. Uh, now, again, that only makes sense if you already have Japanese yen exposure, uh, i.e. you already have earnings that you can use uh, or free cash flow that you can use to service that yen debt. If you create this yen exposure, but you don't have any yen um, currency, now you've actually traded interest rate risk for currency risk. And that's a whole different problem, which we're happy, which I'm happy to talk about too, because we spend a lot of time on that. Uh, but again, in this situation, you know, the, the company has used um, a derivative rather than a financing vehicle to achieve its desired objective. And in this, again, in this scenario, they've gone from 6% expen interest expense to 2% interest expense. It's a huge savings. Uh, now, again, it's, uh, it's not a free lunch. You don't get to just do this. Like I said, you have to have that exposure um, to, to begin with. Um, it's one way of essentially creating a natural hedge on that exposure uh, that, that you have. It may be better, it may be worse than doing a natural yen issuance. So companies really have to evaluate all, all these different tools, but it's much faster to execute than, a, than doing a yen issuance. So much, much faster uh, than doing yen issuance, even for uh, a high yield or investment grade company, cross currency swaps tend to be a, a quicker path that can be executed within days rather than within weeks or, or months. That is super interesting. And so they're able to do that because A, they have a strong activity in the US, for instance, but also some free cash flows in Japan. In Japan, just to stick to the example, right? Though this is not financial advice. Uh, they have revenues in Japan that they're able to leverage into executing a cross-currency swap from their debt in USD to an interest rate repayment in JPI. Th that's and that's exactly where the magic happens. Th that's exactly right. That's exactly right. It's essentially as if it. you had borrowed yen. It's essentially as if you just borrowed yen. And, and had you borrowed uh, in the yen markets, mm -hmm. your interest rate would be lower because Japanese interest rates are lower. Yeah. And so, um, so uh, again, it's a synthetic way of, of achieving the desired outcome. And that's really all derivatives are. Um, for any of your listeners that aren't as familiar with them, it's uh, it's an overlay uh, on, on top of what you have, uh, and you can create these synthetic exposures to whatever you like. Synthetic yen exposure, synthetic fixed rate exposure, turn a term loan B from a, you know, SOFR plus uh, into a fixed rate, uh, essentially uh, turning fixed rate debt into floating rate debt. Uh, it's, it's an overlay on top of uh, your existing capital structure. Absolutely awesome. And so are there any other innovative approaches or strategies that companies can take or should consider uh, in light of these shifts? And when in a period of high interest rates, this cross-currency swap is an excellent one. What else do you recommend the people you talk to and your clients are more? What, what else is out there that corporate treasurers can leverage to navigate those choppy waters, let's say? Yeah, I, I think... Um... I'm going to give. Uh, I'm going to share a counterintuitive idea <laughs> with with folks, and that's actually to borrow a floating rate. That is, see, I, I see your head shaking. <laughs> um, so, um, so, but let me tell you why. If you're, this actually goes back to your investment, uh, the investments conversation we were having earlier. You're an investment grade company. You have cash on hand. You have uh, short term securities. You're earning interest uh, on those. Most investment grade companies have a very heavily fixed rate debt capital structure. And when rates were really low, uh, to the extent that they had policies, which most of them do, uh, around their fixed floating mix, um, they skewed very heavily towards the, the fixed rate side. What's interesting is that, you know, think about the rate environment we're in now. And if rates go higher uh, from an asset liability standpoint, your assets, you'll earn more on your assets. Um, this is overly simplified, but you'll earn more on your assets. Uh, in that world, and you might uh, your your cost of debt will still be fixed. Uh, but if rates go lower, you're going to earn less on your assets, and your cost of debt is still fixed. So now you've actually introduced interest rate risk to to the company that you may have thought was not initially there. So one argument is to actually go floating uh, when, uh, particularly for investment grade companies, to have more floating rate exposure because it will offset some of the assets. To take it one step further, though, uh, it's not enough just to think about assets. It's important to think about your business volatility as well. Uh, and so if you have a business that will do exceptionally well or exceptionally poorly in different, call it macroeconomic cycles, uh, it's worth thinking through the impact that that has 
And that might indicate that you actually want more floating rate date debt or less floating rate debt. If you have a you know cyclical business that will actually have you know less revenue in you know times of uh, in, in economically challenged uh, times or, or fewer earnings uh, in, in economically challenged times, you might actually want to have some debt that allows you to take a, advantage of that, i.e., you know floating rate debt, um, assuming that economically challenged times are equivalent to you know, central banks reducing interest rates. So. I recognize it's very counterintuitive uh, advice given an era of high rates, but uh, but it's actually a it's a more complicated concept than just saying, oh, let me pick high rates or, or low rates. Because if you have the ability to uh, to mitigate that risk um, through your business, or that bis- that risk can be accentuated um, through your your capital structure and through your assets and how you generate cash as a business. It's all worth uh, taking into consideration before making some blanket statement on be all fixed or be all floating. Well, do you see any impact of this on the way treasury departments are also managing their FX? I mean, you can't really talk uh, interest rates without talking interest rates differentials, especially nowadays we see across lots of different countries, different uh, central bank policies really affecting the differences in these bond markets, interest rates in different countries that tends to drive FX up and down one way or the other as well. And um, are those two conversations not intrinsically linked? And if so, how is that affected nowadays? Yeah, some they, they definitely are linked. Uh, I think they, they sometimes tend to get uh, separated for, from one another, but but it's hard to really totally separate them. One, uh, maybe a few things we've seen, um, and then let's take a step back the last few years. Uh, we've seen historical dollar strength. Um, that's good or bad for companies, depending on, you know, your perspective and currency uh, footprint. We saw that historic strength followed by a rapid weakening of the dollar. Uh, and everyone thought, oh, that was just a little short-term blip. We don't need to think about that anymore. And of course, that was followed by a return to strength of, uh, of the dollar. I think more than even interest rates, what we're living through is a time period where many uh, corporate treasury professionals and corporate finance professionals just haven't seen. We haven't seen... Uh, scenario where we have, you know, globally high interest rates, while arguably the largest or second largest economy in the world is uh, is actually slowing down. That is not a scenario that we have seen in quite a long time, and we don't know exactly what that will mean uh, for for everybody. So, the consequence of this on FX is, and I hate to be a little bit of a broken record, it's have have a game plan, have a policy that survives any market environment is what we've seen. A lot of companies are looking back at the policies uh, and their programs and saying, hey, you know, this isn't quite doing what I thought it was going to be doing. Or we had a company come to us not that long ago and say, you know, we're hedging everything, L- literally hedging everything. We're spending tens of millions of dollars on forward points um, on our balance sheet program. And I'm not actually reducing that much risk. Like if, if only I could just stop hedging these three currencies you know, what we told them was, ah, well, you could save half your expenses and you'd still be reducing something like 85% of the risk. Is that trade-off worth it or not? Some CFOs uh, will say, absolutely not. I never want to answer an FX call on an earnings call or FX question on an earnings call. So hedge everything. I don't care what it costs. Most CFOs don't say that. Most CFOs say, if you can get 80, 85% of the benefit for only 50% of the cost, that's a good trade. Let's do that. And so... So really, you know, forward points are changing to, to your point, but more broadly, the there's more volatility uh, and it's a very different macro environment than what we've seen, uh, which means taking another look at the program for, and, and the interesting reality is only about half of companies, only about half of multinationals hedge their FX. That's surprisingly low, uh, if you uh, ask me, and that doesn't mean you need this big, robust program that a Fortune 100 would, would do. Um, you know, uh, Fortune 50 would, would do, but there are tools and ca- capabilities that are out there that can allow even, you know, I, I'd call it uh, billion dollar turnover uh, companies to be able to run programs effectively and efficiently like companies that are a hundred times their size. And do you see that like also split, uh, seep into these, because I think one of the interesting things that's come out of this conversation more is like the insight into these innovative uh products that are coming out that are helping us navigate these kind of environments 
So do you see the same thing in FX? I mean, you talked about the currency swaps earlier. Anything else that you saw that like really impacts this FX hedging space? So uh, I'm going to say something that's going to probably be unpopular with the, uh, with some of the audience. <laughs> but uh, are you are you okay if I can get a little controversial of here? Course. We, we are prepared. Uh, we prepared. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> so uh, I think there's a lot of innovative products being pitched in FX um, today, most of which are not at all fit for purpose. Um, okay. And so um, I tried to uh, tone it down a little bit. Mellow, yeah. um, and probably most companies should be using forwards, not options. This is not a blanket statement, but if if you're being sold double knock-in, knock-out products or any type of exotic FX um, trade, which is allowing you to maybe get a better rate or get something, get more flexibility, my suspicion is that that it's not fit for purpose uh, and it will go away when you need it the most. And so again, it's a bit of a blanket statement, but it's uh, it's important to note that I think financing markets, like all markets, when you hit a challenge or stumble, derivatives markets, financing markets, uh, there are creative solutions uh, around all of the, the problems that exist. Some of those are good creative solutions and some of them are bad creative solutions. Knowing the difference is what separates, you know, the, the companies that are going to, you know, be able to withstand these types of uh, challenges, and the uh, treasury professionals that are going to be able to make it through multiple cycles, uh, versus those that are going to be short-term focused and just make it through, you know, the next month or quarter. Uh, and, you know, as unpopular as it is to go to the board or the CFO, uh, I think one of the most important conversations that treasurers can have today is saying. I know this feels hard. Yes, the cost is higher. Here is why this makes sense on a long-term basis, because it's the treasurer's job to think liquidity and long-term for the company. Uh, and if he or she is overridden by the board or the CFO or the CEO, that's a different story, but um, it takes courage to have the difficult conversations. It's very interesting. So keep it simple is the large message, especially when it comes to FX. Don't, don't get drawn into the fairy tales that some of these products are bringing. That, that, yeah, so that, 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 that's exactly right. It's, um, th there is no such thing as a free lunch, um, is, uh, you know, the, the old phrase that, you know, um, or uh, what do they say? If you've ever played poker and you don't know who, you don't know who the, the sucker, sucker is, you, <laughs> um, then yeah. yes, exactly. So, um, so again, I, I think it's not to denigrate all products and, and all situations and, uh, uh, and those who are, Pitching these, there's absolutely value in them. There are absolutely scenarios, and we've seen it where companies have very complex contracts with their customers. They might actually have embedded options with their customers that would be best by offsetting them, but with you know uh, different structures of options with counterparties on, on the FX side. Generally, uh, I, I would say stick to the simple uh, on uh, on FX, and and we're seeing that uh, today that companies. Are the biggest questions that CFOs are asking treasurers and boards are asking treasurers are, am I protected? What happens if you know X, Y, Z occurs? Uh, and before it was what happens if the euro breaks up. Now it's what happens if the dollar goes back and we break parity on the euro again. You know, are we okay? And you know, what does this mean for us? And uh, you know that you know the the most sophisticated um, treasurers actually tend to keep it the most simple. It has been my experience. And if you'd allow me, Amor, uh, to play a bit with the, with the topic, what do you think about the AI advancements and innovations when it comes to FX and interest rate risk management? Are they to be put in the same bucket for now? Because maybe they are not advanced enough. Have you seen some solutions that actually bring um, huge or at least substantial benefits? What's your overall opinion about artificial intelligence, especially in those tools that help corporates navigate foreign currency management? Well, given how fast uh, AI is uh, improving and, and changing, I think I'd probably be a little bit of a fool to say that, uh, you know, that uh, that's not going to impact anything. Uh, we have seen some and, and we have some tools where, uh, that are, you know, leveraging uh, these different uh, capabilities. And, you know, one question that, that companies often spend a lot of time on is where is all of my noise coming from in my FX program? I have an FX, I have FX exposures, I have FX uh, hedges. Why aren't they perfectly matching uh, one another? The way to answer that is analyzing lots and lots and lots of data. Um, it's not just 
how much euro exposure do I have and how much euro hedges do I have? It, when did that euro exposure come on? At what rate did it come on? Was the euro exposure actually euro exposure or was it dollar exposure that somebody in you know Belgium booked as euro exposure even though it was really dollar exposure? It's getting into all these, these types of weeds, which requires lots of... Um, it requires uh, analysis of the data as well as insight into an, an organization. And my suspicion is that there are tools that will be developed over time that will take at least one piece of that equation and make it a button click as opposed to, uh, you know, diving into an Excel spreadsheet, thousands of rows, you know, lots of different lines, understanding what, what each of them uh, means. Whether AI will be able to understand whether the, you know, the person who inputs invoices in Belgium actually meant to put it in euros or dollars, I don't know. I don't want to um, guess on that, but, uh, but it's been surprisingly helpful and helped my parents plan a trip to Scotland uh, a year or so uh, ago. So, you know, you can probably get a lot. Uh, you can probably get a lot more out of AI than, than we think. But I think in the FX and I'd say corporate finance world, there, there's some room to go before we get to that realized state. Uh, I wouldn't ignore it, uh, but, but I wouldn't say we're, we're there yet. Amazing. Amol, thank you so much for that. We'd like to talk a bit about Chatham Financials. Could you walk us through what the mission statement of Chatham Financial is, please? Yeah, so, so Chatham uh, Guillaume, exists to partner with our clients to enable them to have uh, the best possible capital markets plans, whether that comes a debt capital markets um, strategy to derivatives and financial risk management. Uh, we aim to be the first call for our clients uh, when they're thinking about anything related to, uh, to capital markets uh, activity. We have been in business for over 30 years. We work with uh, over 3,000 companies globally. We have offices headquartered in the US, but uh, offices and uh, multiple offices in, in Europe, uh, multiple offices in the Asia Pacific uh, and Australia region, multiple offices here in the US as well, and working across all industries. So uh, whether it is, uh, whether you're a, a tech company, a commercial real estate firm, private equity sponsor, a financial institution, insurance company. We have insight across all of those uh, different industries and provide uh, capital market solutions, again, whether they're advisory uh, in nature or technology-based um, that are focused ultimately on that goal that I mentioned, which is enabling our clients to have the best possible capital markets plan. And so where do you, where do you operate? Is it mostly the US or are you, are you elsewhere as well? Uh, we're a global uh, company, so we are. Uh, we have uh, clients. Uh, while we were started in the U.S., we have a large footprint uh, in uh, in Europe. Uh, our headquarters is in London, and we you know, work with uh, you know hundreds of, of companies in in the U.K. and uh, and on the continent. Uh, operate in uh, the Australia Asia Pacific uh, region as well, uh, because our clients tend to be global. Uh, we we tend to work with large institutions. Uh, whether they're large alternative asset managers that are investing in commercial real estate and uh, and private equity and corporate private equity or infrastructure, or they are insurance companies that are operating in one part of the world or another, or multinational corporates that have operations all over the place. Uh, we found that over the years, you know, having that ability to serve our clients in their local geographies as well as uh, having the uh, the scale that comes with a global uh, footprint are, are really ultimately beneficial to our clients because we can give some insights that uh, you can't get if you're just you know in the U.S. or or in London or or in Singapore. The ability to combine all of that knowledge together allows us to give even better insight to our clients. Super clear. And so I actually heard um, Amal while we were researching for this, you guys recently made quite a big acquisition. Can you tell us about it? Uh, yes, we acquired a company called uh, EA Markets. Uh, we're very excited to bring them uh, and, and their team and then their founder, Ruben Daniels, to Chatham. EA Markets uh, is an investment bank, really uh, agnostic to industry, but focused on enabling uh, their, uh, their clients to have the best overall uh, debt and structured equity capital markets uh, plans. So working with uh, large companies all the way down to smaller companies, very focused on being on the side of the table as uh, as their clients. And so uh, they have the same ethos as, as we do at, at Chatham. And, and we're excited to be able to bring this type of uh, debt capital markets, structured equity capital markets capability into our clients on a broader basis. We've worked with our clients on derivative transactions for years. But as we talked about earlier, 
a derivative is just an overlay. You, you, you don't do a der uh, derivative without having, for example, some type of debt uh, that you're trying to, uh, to manage. And very often our clients would come to us and say, hey, what you do for us on the derivative side, you know, helping us structure them, get the best price for them, you know, think through all the conflicts, provide all the support related to it. Can you do that on the debt side? And, and our answer was, we have some expertise there, but, uh, but not all the expertise. And now we're really excited to be able to ha have this broader offering. Uh, to to our clients, super interesting. And how does that so? How does the acquisition Amal fit with your broader landscape that we just talked about about the interest rates going up, BFX and whatnot, and the evolving needs of corporate treasures? Yeah, the the acquisition really allows us to offer a broader set of creative solutions to our clients when they're facing these exact um, challenges and problems of. I have higher interest rates. I don't have as much capital available. What can I do? Um, what's the best way to to fill this gap uh, between, you know, what I want to do and, and what's available um, to me? Uh, bringing in a team like the EA team and a professional like Ruben uh, allows us to really be able to better answer those questions to our clients. We only exist uh, because our clients are asking these types of questions and trying to solve these types of problems. And we've always felt that it's important to be true experts and not just walk into a room and say, oh, you could do X, Y, and Z without knowing how to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, and so uh, it's perfectly aligned with our vision of being that capital markets partner uh, and now just bringing in more expertise uh, to be able to support our clients as they're going through these types of decisions. Well, thank you so much for that masterclass. I think it was, um, I think it's a topic that everyone has heard enough times that, okay, interest rates are high, interest rates are high. Um, I liked your more holistic perspective that, look, yeah, interest rate high. That affects some companies that um, maybe did have uh, their debt restructuring coming now, if you're unlucky to do so, or they're on the floating side of things uh, with their debt. Um, the ones, a lot of clients, it's interesting to also, yeah, you never really think about the ones that aren't affected by the high interest rates, right? Which is the ones that had their debt, they're laughing now, and uh, they're like, thank God, we just restructured, well, two years ago, three years ago, five years ago, for 30 years, for example. So that, that definitely puts them in a much better position or if indeed you're cash rich. Um, and then the interesting thing on these new products that seem to be helping out with a lot of these things. And then, of course, that fact that perhaps you should have a floating floating interest rate on a lot of the debt that you're covering right now, which tells me that you do believe it's going to come down again, the interest rates, uh, or there's a good chance of it and you, you're with the market on that. Is that the right way to put it? I think it's hard, it's hard to fight the market, but uh, over a long enough time period, I find it highly unlikely that we're going to stay at 5% uh, forever for the next 50 years. I mean, there's going to be ups, there's going to be downs. And it's back to what we talked about earlier, Sam. It's, uh, you know, what kind of plan do you have uh, as, as an organization that will survive, you know, any of these types of challenges that, that might come up against it? It might not be the perfect plan in all situations and all, in all environments, um, but, but what's available that you can then fine tune uh, as you have more insight into what's happening on the business, what's happening on, in the environment. And I think that's really, um, even those companies that you, you mentioned that, that are not impacted and what they're spending their time on is thinking about what's next or what's next. next. Uh, they're, they're not just, you know, I, I don't think anyone in corporate treasury just gets to sit there and twiddle their thumbs and say, look, you know, everything's great. And so I think that's, uh, that, that's an important uh, it's an important insight for, for everyone to have that even if you're not impacted, um, you still are impacted. For those that are really dealing with these decisions right now, it's as good a time as any to think deeply about what the future is going to look like for your organization as well as for the, the market. Yeah, I, I like that perspective as well. Don't have this like fear of, what, well, it's terrible right now. Make the best plan that you can with the current situation. And I think that's spoken like a good corporate treasure, I think. Is, uh, is indeed to, to have that strategy. Amal, thank you so much. Um, is there anything about any of the topics that we didn't cover that you want to you want to add on? No, I don't think so. I think uh, I think we covered a lot of different topics. Um, yeah. And uh, I'm not even sure if the, what time it is, but uh, oh, okay, time has flown by. <laughs> yeah, indeed. We took up, we filled up a whole hour. Don't worry. We have a good episode out of it as well. And, and if people want to find out more about you or Chapman Financial, where can they go to to do that? Yeah, please uh, feel free to come to our website, www.chathamfinancial.com. Uh, we have a lot of great insights on there around markets, uh, around what's happening with uh, our clients. And, and you can reach out to me or, or any one of uh, my fellow 
uh, team members uh, to, to talk about different ways that Chatham can help you and support your organization. And all those links will be in the show notes below. Amal, thank you so much. Thank you.